How to Receive Money from God Written and published by God Daily News You might have often heard about the concept of divine prosperity, a euphemistic term for receiving financial blessings from God. The Bible, in fact, offers a treasure trove of wisdom on this subject. But how do you tap into this divine provision? You'll find it's not as simple as asking and receiving, it's a journey of faith, trust, and spiritual growth. Curious about the steps you can take to align yourself with God's abundance? Stick around, and we'll explore this intriguing topic together using biblical references as our guide. Chapter 1 The Power of God's Abundance Understanding God's abundance isn't about amassing wealth, it's about recognizing His endless capacity to bless you beyond your wildest expectations. You see, God's abundance is both a promise and a principle embedded deep in the scriptures. In the Bible, God's abundance is vividly portrayed, from the creation of the world to the blessings bestowed upon Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Exodus 3 verse 8, God describes a land flowing with milk and honey, symbolizing abundance. But it's not just about material wealth. It's about God's generosity in granting wisdom, peace, grace, and salvation. God's abundance is a theological concept rooted in His character. He's described as a generous giver, with James 1 verse 17 stating, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. It's about His magnanimity, His desire to lavish His love and blessings upon you. Analyzing God's abundance requires a paradigm shift. You're not trying to squeeze blessings from a stingy deity. Instead, you're opening your hands and heart to receive from a loving Father who delights in blessing His children. It's a move from scarcity to abundance, from fear to faith. Chapter 2 Cultivating a Faith-Filled Heart To cultivate a faith-filled heart, you must actively believe in God's abundant love and blessings, a concept deeply rooted in biblical teachings. This isn't a passive process, it's a conscious and deliberate journey of internalizing God's word and believing in His promises. Remember, faith isn't just about believing in God, it's about believing in who God says you are. You're His beloved child, deserving of His blessings and love. This is a theology central to the Christian faith and is echoed in scriptures such as 1 John 3 verse 1, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. Your faith-filled heart shouldn't only be a vessel of belief but also a beacon of hope. This hope isn't an empty one, it's rooted in the certainty of God's promises, as stated in Hebrews 11 verse 1, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. You're not just hoping for God's blessings, you're confident they're coming your way. Cultivate your faith-filled heart through prayer, studying the Word, and living a life that mirrors God's love. As you grow in faith, you'll notice a shift in your mindset and attitude towards receiving God's blessings, including financial ones. So, keep nurturing your faith. It's the key to unlocking God's abundance in your life. Chapter 3 Seeking First the Kingdom of God In your journey of faith, seeking first the kingdom of God is an essential step, as declared in Matthew 6 verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This verse is a clear directive from Jesus himself, emphasizing the importance of prioritizing God's kingdom above all else. The term, kingdom of God, is a profound theological concept. It doesn't merely refer to a physical realm or place, but rather a spiritual domain where God's will, authority, and righteousness reign supreme. Seeking it first means aligning your desires, goals, and actions with the principles of God's kingdom and striving to live righteously. One might ask, what does this have to do with receiving money from God? The answer lies in the latter part of Matthew 6 verse 33, and all these things will be given to you as well. The things here encompass your needs, including financial. When you prioritize God's kingdom, He ensures your needs are met. However, it's crucial to understand that this doesn't promote a prosperity gospel where God is seen as a cosmic ATM. 
Instead, it's about understanding that God is the provider of all good things, including financial resources, when we seek His kingdom first. Chapter 4 Trusting in God's Provision Building on the foundational principle of seeking God's kingdom, you're now faced with the challenge of wholeheartedly trusting in God's provision. It's not merely a passive acceptance but an active trust, a deep-seated confidence that God will provide for your needs. Philippians 4 verse 19 assures us, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. This scripture is a promise. It's not a maybe or a might, but a will. God will meet all your needs. Notice, it doesn't say wants or desires, but needs. God knows the difference. Trusting in God's provision is about understanding that God knows what we need better than we do. Yet, trusting can be difficult. It's easy to trust when things are going well, but when you're facing financial hardship, that trust can waver. The journey of trust isn't a linear one, it has its ups and downs, its moments of frustration and moments of peace. But remember, Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6 encourages us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways submit to Him, and He'll make your paths straight. Trust is also about patience. You're not ordering from a menu where you can pick and choose what you want and when you want it. It's about waiting on God's timing and recognizing His sovereignty. So, trust in God's provision, for He's faithful and His promises are true. Chapter 5 Sowing Seeds of Giving As you journey towards understanding God's provision, it's crucial to grasp the principle of sowing seeds of giving, a concept deeply rooted in Scripture and pivotal to receiving from God. This concept, often overlooked, operates on the fundamental biblical law of sowing and reaping, where your giving is the seed that brings forth a plentiful harvest. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6-7 explains this principle succinctly, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's not just about the act of giving, but the heart behind it that matters to God. The seeds you sow today in your giving have a direct impact on the harvest you'll reap tomorrow. It's about planting seeds of faith and generosity that will bear fruit in your life. But it's also about understanding that these seeds must be sown in fertile ground, in causes and people that align with God's kingdom. Sowing seeds of giving isn't a transactional process with God, but a transformational one. It's not about giving to get, but giving to grow, in generosity, in faith, and in your relationship with God. When you grasp this concept and apply it in your life, you're positioning yourself to receive God's provision in ways you've never imagined. Chapter 6 Honoring God with Your Finances Moving forward, it's essential that you understand how to honor God with your finances, which is a direct reflection of your trust and obedience to His Word. Remember, it's not about the amount, but the heart behind the giving. In Proverbs 3 verses 9 to 10, the Bible instructs, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the firstfruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Essentially, this scripture speaks to the principle of firstfruits, giving God the first and best of what we have, which in today's context, includes our finances. It's not a divine lottery where you give to get. Rather, it's about acknowledging God as the source of everything you have and demonstrating your trust in Him to provide for your needs. In fact, when you honor God with your finances, you're expressing your faith in His ability to take care of you, just as in Matthew 6 verse 33, Jesus instructed, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Honoring God with your finances also involves wise stewardship. The parable of the talents in Matthew 25 verses 14 to 30 teaches us the importance of using what God has entrusted to us wisely and productively. Chapter 7 Embracing a Spirit of Generosity To truly embrace a spirit of generosity, you need to understand and embody God's teachings about giving, as evidenced in scriptures such as 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, 
Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. What this scripture exemplifies is the heart of generosity, which is an act of love and not a duty. God doesn't need your money, it's your heart he's after. When you give cheerfully, it's a sign that you understand God's own generosity and love. It's a reflection of his character in you. Now, you might be wondering, how do I cultivate this spirit of generosity? Well, the answer lies in understanding God's own generosity towards us. John 3 verse 16 makes it clear, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. God gave what was most precious to him because of his love for us. This is the truest form of generosity. Chapter 8 Walking in Obedience to God Cultivating a spirit of generosity is deeply intertwined with walking in obedience to God, another pivotal aspect of receiving from Him. Obeying God isn't a burdensome chore, but a joy-filled commitment to living a life that reflects His divine order. It's about aligning your actions, thoughts, and choices with His instructions as revealed in the Bible. God's word in Deuteronomy 28 verses 1-2 says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all His commands, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. It's clear that obedience to God is a prerequisite for His blessings. But what does it mean to walk in obedience? It means listening to God's voice and following His guidance, even when it's difficult or doesn't make sense. It's about surrendering your will to His and trusting Him with every aspect of your life. Walking in obedience also involves repentance. When you stumble, don't wallow in guilt or shame, but turn back to God, confess your sins, and ask for His forgiveness. 1 John 1 verse 9 assures us that, if we confess our sins, He's faithful, and Justin will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Chapter 9 Claiming God's Promises Embrace the biblical truth that God's promises are yours to claim, as an integral part of your journey towards receiving God's blessings. The Bible, in its wisdom and breadth, provides countless instances where God's promises are laid out for His followers. You've got to understand that these promises aren't mere poetic phrases, but divine assurances from the Creator Himself. They're the spiritual keys to unlock the treasury of heaven's blessings, including financial abundance. However, claiming God's promises isn't as simple as picking a ripe fruit from a tree. It requires an understanding of the context and the conditions that come with it. For instance, the promise in Philippians 4 verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus, is tied to the Philippians' generosity. It's not a blanket promise for all, but for those who align themselves with God's principles of giving. Similarly, in Malachi 3 verse 10, God promises to open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. This promise is connected to the act of faithful tithing. Therefore, Claiming God's promises requires your active participation, aligning your actions with His Word. It's not a passive, name-it-and-claim-it mentality, but rather an active partnership with the Divine. As you walk in obedience and claim His promises, you'll find yourself on a path of divine provision and abundance. Chapter 10 Praying with Faith and Belief In your journey towards divine provision, an essential step is praying with unwavering faith and belief, aligning your heart to the truth of God's promises. This practice isn't about blind adherence to a ritual, but rather, an earnest, heartfelt conversation with God. It's about demonstrating faith, so profound that it stirs God's heart and provokes His divine response. The Bible, in Hebrews 11 verse 1, states that, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In essence, you're praying with an assured conviction that God will provide, despite your current circumstances. You're not just hoping, you're certain. That's the kind of faith that moves mountains, as stated in Matthew 17 verse 20. Moreover, James 1 verses 6-7 instructs, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, 
because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. So, while praying for provision, doubt must be banished. You've got to believe, with every fiber of your being, that God is more than able to supply your needs. Therefore, cultivate an attitude of faith-filled prayer. This isn't about using prayer as a magic formula to manipulate God, it's about aligning your will with His, trusting in His promises, and demonstrating faith in His ability to provide. As you do this, you'll position yourself to receive His divine provision, in accordance with His perfect will and timing. Chapter 11 Tithing as an Act of Worship As you deepen your faith and trust in God's provision, tithing emerges as a significant act of worship, demonstrating your recognition of God as the source of all your blessings. It's not just a mandated practice, but a tangible embodiment of your heartfelt gratitude. According to Proverbs 3 verse 9, we're instructed to honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. This biblical principle of tithing isn't about God needing our money, it's about our need to show God our trust in His provision. Tithing isn't a mere financial transaction, but a spiritual discipline that aligns our hearts with God's. It's a way of acknowledging that everything we've is a gift from God and we're simply returning a portion of it back to Him. The act of tithing also has a transformative effect on our spiritual lives. When you tithe, you're openly declaring that your trust isn't in your wealth, but in the God who provides. This act of faith can lead to a more profound understanding of God's grace and generosity. Chapter 12 Partnering with God in Finances Taking a step further in your spiritual journey, it's crucial to understand that partnering with God in your finances goes beyond tithing and enters the realm of stewardship. This partnership is more than a transactional relationship, it's a covenantal commitment where you manage God's resources on His behalf. Scripturally, the concept of stewardship is deeply rooted in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2, it's written, Now it's required that those who've been given a trust must prove faithful. This verse underscores the responsibility that comes with God's provision, urging you to be faithful stewards. When you view your finances through this lens, you realize that everything you have, your income, assets, and possessions, aren't truly yours, they're entrusted to you by God. You're simply a manager of His resources. This understanding changes your perspective, fostering a spirit of gratitude and contentment. In this partnership, your role is to use God's resources wisely, aligning your financial decisions with His principles. Proverbs 3 verses 9 to 10 encourages you to honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. In honoring God with your finances, you open the door for His blessings. Partnering with God in finances isn't about acquiring wealth for your own sake. It's about acknowledging God's sovereignty over all things, including your finances. As you commit to this partnership, you're aligning your financial life with God's will, positioning yourself to receive His blessings. Chapter 13 Letting Go of Greed and Fear You cannot properly manage God's resources if you are filled with greed and fear. Instead, you must let go of these emotions in order to genuinely collaborate with God in your finances. Greed and fear are contrary to the attributes of God, who's generous, loving, and faithful. They'll lead you away from God's providential path, causing you to rely on your strength and wisdom instead of His. You see, greed, as depicted in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10, can trap you in a cycle of never-ending want. You're told, whoever loves money never has enough, whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This is the trap of greed. It's an insatiable craving that can lead you to compromise your faith, integrity, and stewardship. Fear, on the other hand, can immobilize you and prevent you from making sound financial decisions. Proverbs 29 verse 25 warns, Fear of men will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. When you operate out of fear, you're likely to make choices that aren't in line with God's will. Chapter 14 Living a Life of Stewardship 
Why is stewardship crucial in your journey to receiving money from God? It's because stewardship is a manifestation of your understanding of God's grace and your role in God's kingdom. You see, when you manage your resources well, you're not just being practical, you're acknowledging that all you have, including your finances, comes from God. Think of it this way, God entrusts you with resources, not for you to squander, but to use wisely. You're a manager, not an owner. The Bible emphasizes this in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2 where it says, Now it's required that those who've been given a trust must prove faithful. This means that you're accountable to God for how you handle what He provides. Living a life of stewardship involves being generous, just as God is generous to you. In Proverbs 11 verses 24 to 25, it's written, One person gives freely, yet gains even more, another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Demonstrating generosity reflects God's character and blesses you in return. Chapter 15 Seeking Wise Counsel and Guidance In your journey to financial blessings, it's crucial you seek wise counsel and guidance, acknowledging that God's wisdom surpasses all. The book of Proverbs 15 verse 22 says, Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. This scripture highlights the importance of seeking wisdom and advice from those who have discernment and understanding. It's essential to remember that not all advice aligns with God's will. You must discern which advice to follow and which to discard. James 1 verse 5 advises, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. This scripture is a reminder that God is the ultimate source of wisdom and He's willing to provide it generously when asked. Moreover, Proverbs 11 verse 14 cautions, Where there's no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors there's safety. This scripture underlines the necessity of having godly counsel in our lives. It's not just about seeking advice, but about seeking the right advice from the right people. In seeking wise counsel and guidance, it's crucial to find individuals who fear the Lord and seek His wisdom above all else. Proverbs 9 verse 10 states, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. As you seek financial blessings from God, remember to seek His wisdom and guidance first, knowing that His understanding surpasses all human understanding. Chapter 16 Focusing on Eternal Treasures while seeking wisdom and guidance is important, don't forget that God calls us to set our hearts on eternal treasures rather than earthly ones. This concept, deeply rooted in Scripture, challenges us to shift our focus from temporal, worldly wealth to eternal, spiritual riches. In Matthew 6 verses 19-20, Jesus clearly instructs, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So, what does it mean to focus on eternal treasures? It's not merely about renouncing material wealth, but understanding its transient nature. You need to grasp that earthly riches can't provide the deep, lasting fulfillment that only comes from a relationship with God. A significant part of this process involves aligning your desires with God's will. In Psalm 37 verse 4, we're told, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. This doesn't imply that God will fulfill every worldly wish, but rather, as you grow in your relationship with Him, your desires will increasingly reflect His. The goal isn't to completely abandon pursuit of earthly wealth, but to ensure it doesn't overshadow your quest for spiritual riches. Pursue wealth as a tool to serve God and others, not as an end in itself. Remember, True wealth is measured not by the abundance of one's possessions, but by the quality of one's relationship with God. By focusing on eternal treasures, you'll discover the true blessing of receiving from God. Chapter 17 Declaring God's Blessings Often, declaring God's blessings isn't just about verbal affirmations, it's a profound act of faith that aligns your spirit with God's promises as revealed in Scripture. When you declare God's blessings, you're not just making a wish, but you're speaking out God's promises for your life, anchoring your faith in His Word, 
and engaging in a spiritual exercise that fortifies your hope. Theologically, this principle is deeply rooted in the Bible. Proverbs 18 verse 21 states, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, implying that our words have power and can shape our realities. Similarly, Mark 11 verses 23 to 24 encourages you to, Say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and chant doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he'll have whatsoever he saith. Your words, spoken in faith, can manifest in the physical realm. Analytically, declaring God's blessings involves a threefold process. First, you must understand God's promises as outlined in the Bible. Second, you must believe these promises are for you, this requires faith. Finally, you must speak these promises out loud, declaring them over your life. Remember, your declaration should always align with God's will as revealed in His Word. Scripturally, numerous examples exist of individuals who declared God's blessings and saw them manifest. Abraham, for instance, was called to declare that he was a father of many nations even before he'd a child. His faith, coupled with his declaration, led to the fulfillment of God's promise. In the same spirit, as you declare God's blessings, remember to do so in faith, grounded in Scripture, and aligned with God's will. Chapter 18 Overcoming Financial Challenges Navigating through financial challenges, you can find solace and guidance in God's Word, and through faith, you'll see that He provides a pathway to overcoming these hurdles. Remember, God's promises are true, and He's a sure provider even in times of financial distress. In the Bible, the book of Philippians 4 verse 19 reassures, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. This scripture reinforces the certainty that God will provide for you abundantly, even when you're faced with financial hardships. It's not just about material wealth, but also about meeting your needs at the right time and in the right way. When you're in financial difficulties, it's easy to become anxious and lose hope. However, Matthew 6 verse 34 urges, So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This scripture encourages you to focus on the present, trusting in God's provision, rather than worrying about the future. Moreover, financial challenges often lead to a sense of inadequacy and feeling of failure. Yet, in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, God assures us that, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Hence, even in your financial weakness, God's grace is sufficient, and His power is made manifest. Chapter 19 Building a Foundation on God's Word Having established the assurance of God's provision in times of financial distress, it's important for you to build your life on the solid foundation of God's Word. This foundation won't only provide stability in times of financial uncertainty, but also guide you in navigating through life's complexities. Theological analysis reveals the significance of God's Word as a guide. The Bible, as God's Word, is described as, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, Psalm 119 verse 105. This metaphor implies that God's Word illuminates your path, providing clarity and direction in your financial journey. It's essential to study and understand God's Word, using it as your moral compass in making financial decisions. Scripturally, building a foundation on God's Word involves more than mere knowledge, it requires application. James 1 verse 22 encourages you to be doers of the Word, and not hearers only. This means you must apply biblical principles, such as stewardship, integrity, and generosity in your financial dealings. Analytically, a life built on God's Word is likely to experience divine provision. Proverbs 3 verses 9 to 10 promises that when you honor God with your wealth and with the firstfruits of your produce, your barns will be filled with plenty. Thus, obedience to God's Word attracts His provision. Chapter 20 Receiving God's Grace and Mercy As you journey into understanding the role of God's grace and mercy in your financial life, it's crucial to recognize that these unmerited favors are key to receiving divine provision. 
God's grace is his undeserved favor extended to us, it is a gift that he freely bestows on us despite our lack of merit. His mercy, on the other hand, is his loving compassion for us, sparing us from the consequences of our mistakes. In your quest for financial breakthrough, you can't overlook the importance of God's grace and mercy. They're not just spiritual concepts, they're also financial principles. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, For it's by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this isn't from yourselves, it's the gift of God. This gift includes not just salvation but also provision for our needs. Likewise, Lamentations 3 verses 22 to 23 reminds us, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, His mercies never come to an end, they're new every morning, great is your faithfulness. This is a testament to God's daily provision and mercy in our lives. However, receiving God's grace and mercy isn't a passive activity. You must actively seek them through prayer, faith, and obedience to His Word. You've to humble yourself, acknowledging that you can't achieve financial success by your strength. Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 6 advises, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways submit to Him, and He'll make your paths straight. This path includes the journey towards financial stability and prosperity. Don't forget, God's grace and mercy are the divine keys unlocking the door to your financial breakthrough. Chapter 21 Investing in Kingdom Purposes In your journey towards financial freedom, investing in kingdom purposes serves as a vital step, aligning your resources with God's will and opening the floodgates for divine provision. This practice is more than a mere transaction, it's a spiritual commitment that deepens your relationship with God and reflects your faith in His promises. Scripturally, you'll find numerous references to the significance of kingdom investment. Consider Matthew 6 verse 20, where Jesus instructs us to store up treasures in heaven, rather than on earth. Here, treasures represent your time, talents, and resources. By investing these in God's kingdom, you're essentially depositing into your heavenly account a form of wealth that neither moth nor rust can destroy. Proverbs 3 verses 9 to 10 further supports this concept, urging us to honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Investing in God's work first illustrates your trust in Him to supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. To invest in kingdom purposes doesn't necessarily mean giving all you have to the church or charities. It's about using God-given resources wisely for kingdom advancement. This could be supporting a missionary, funding a church project, or helping a neighbor in need. Chapter 22 Surrendering Control to God While investing in kingdom purposes is a powerful act of faith, fully surrendering control to God marks a profound deepening of your spiritual journey. This surrender isn't about giving up or losing, it's about recognizing and accepting God's sovereignty in every aspect of your life, including your financial situation. In surrendering control, you're not simply letting go, you're actively placing your trust in God. You're affirming, as Proverbs 3 verse 5 advises, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This scripture underlines the importance of faith in God's wisdom over our own. This step requires humility, acknowledging that God's knowledge and wisdom far surpass ours. It's about coming to terms with the fact that we can't control everything, but we can trust in the one who can. The Apostle Paul's words in Philippians 4 verses 6-7 serve as a guide here, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Surrendering control to God also means allowing Him to direct your steps, including your financial decisions. Psalm 37 verse 5 tells us, Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him and He'll do this. By entrusting your financial matters to God, you make room for His divine guidance, opening the door to unexpected blessings and divine provision. Chapter 23 Transforming Your Money Mindset Embracing a transformation in your money mindset is a crucial step towards aligning your financial life with God's word and promises. It's not just about acquiring more wealth or securing a better job. 
It's about understanding God's perspective on money and aligning your thoughts, attitudes, and actions accordingly. Start by examining your current beliefs about wealth. Often, people view money as a source of security, power, or happiness. But the Bible teaches that true security comes from God, not wealth, Proverbs 18 verses 10 to 11. God is the provider of every good thing, James 1 verse 17, and true happiness comes from a relationship with Him, not from material possessions, Luke 12 verse 15. Let go of the worldly mindset that money is the answer to all problems. Jesus warned that the love of money can lead us astray, Matthew 6 verse 24. Instead, strive to see money as a tool to be used wisely and generously in service of God and others. Remember the parable of the talents, Matthew 25 verses 14 to 30. God expects us to use what He's given us responsibly and productively. It's not about hoarding wealth, but about stewarding God's resources well. Chapter 24 Practicing Gratitude and Thankfulness As you align your financial perspective with God's teachings, fostering a heart full of gratitude and thankfulness becomes a key component in your journey. This shift in perspective isn't just about saying thank you for the blessings you've received. It's about cultivating a deep appreciation for God's provision and love in every aspect of your life. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, we're told, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This scripture doesn't suggest you should only be thankful for the good times. It implies gratitude in hardship, gratitude in scarcity, and gratitude even when you're waiting for God's promises to manifest. When you practice gratitude, you're acknowledging God's sovereignty over all things. You're saying, I trust you, Lord, even when I can't see the full picture. This attitude opens your heart to receive more from God because you're demonstrating faith in His perfect plan. Practicing gratitude also brings you into a closer relationship with God. It forces you to shift your focus from what you don't have to what you do have. It helps you see the world through God's eyes, recognizing the blessings in every situation. Chapter 25 Testifying to God's Provision Speaking up about God's provision in your life is a powerful way to acknowledge His influence and show others how His blessings manifest. Your testimony isn't merely about sharing your story, it's an act of worship, a demonstration of faith, and a tool for evangelization. In 1 Chronicles 16 verses 8-9, to it's written, Give thanks to the Lord, call on His name, make known among the nations what He's done. Sing to Him, sing praise to Him, tell of all His wonderful acts. This scripture encourages you to publicly acknowledge God's handiwork in your life. By doing so, you're not only expressing gratitude but also inspiring others to seek His abundance. Consider the story of the healed leper in Luke 17 verses 15 to 16. After Jesus healed ten lepers, only one came back to thank Him and testify to His healing power. This act of testifying glorified God and validated the leper's faith, leading to his salvation. Similarly, when you testify to God's financial provision, you're affirming your trust in his promises and his ability to fulfill them. Testifying isn't just about vocal declarations. It's also reflected in your actions. As Matthew 5 verse 16 says, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When you faithfully steward the resources God entrusts to you, you're bearing witness to His providence. So, you've mastered the divine ATM, huh? Just remember, it's not about the cha-ching. Instead, focus on surrendering control, sowing seeds of generosity, and sporting a grateful heart. The true treasure isn't in the bank, it's in having a faith-filled heart and a transformed mindset. God's provision isn't a get-rich-quick scheme, it's a spiritual journey. Now go, testify to His abundant provision, but remember, it's about His kingdom, not your kingdom. Thanks for listening.